right, thank you. Uh, so welcome everybody to our presentation now on the namespacing of the Linux integrity measurement architecture. My name is Stefan Berger. I work for IBM Research, and this is my co-presenter. Uh, I'm Christian. I work at uh, Microsoft. And yes. Yep. Uh, so just for those of you who don't know the integrity measurement architecture, I just want to say quickly what it does. Basically, it ex it's allowed, allows you to configure it via a policy, and it extends the trusted boot that uh, the BIOS, for example, starts and allows you to measure uh, applications and executables and libraries um, that you start in, under Linux. And then also it extends secure boot, uh, where it allows you to uh, enforce the signatures on, on executables um, so that you can ensure that only sanctions executables are being started under, under Linux. So that works today on the Linux host but uh, we want to make that available to um, containers. This is not the first time um, we, I have actually presented IMA namespacing. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I was already presented it at Plumbers. Um, we had a different, slightly different architecture, but I think due to the help of Christian and uh, James Bottomley, we have put the train on the right track, or better track this time, and hope to be able to upstream this work uh, the first path series of the patches is out on the mailing list, and um, well, we hope for collaboration to, to get the, uh, the next part upstream. Right. Um, I'm one of the, I would say, main reviewers, so I'm not necessarily the, uh, uh, involved in all of the uh, architectural stuff and so on. Um, so I'm the running commentary during this presentation, more or less. Um, yeah, so uh, the motivation is probably something that uh, um, Stefan can uh, cover a lot better, better than um, I can. But here you can see the points like the configurable uh, IMAP policy um, allowing to, or do you want to say something about this yourself? But, yeah, basically what we want to be able to do is uh, allow IMA to be able, uh, IMA to be configurable uh, inside the namespace uh, with a policy. So that, for example, when you have a, when you set auditing rules inside the namespace, that uh, the um, the namespace is going to emit audit log entries on the host, and ideally those audit log entries on the host would be um, distinguishable from those uh, that you're setting from the uh, on the host, right? So that you have distinguishable audit rule audit messages that uh, originate from the container versus those from the host. And then we want to be able to use the IMA policy uh, for enabling IMA measurement. So we want to have a, a log per IMA namespace so that you can see what exactly was executed inside uh, an IMA namespace. And then uh, um, logging and measurements often go hand in hand with attestation, right? And in that case, we want to be able to attach a virtual TPM to the IMA namespace. And the virtual TPM then would vouch via a a PCR quote for the validity of the log. Right. And then another major use case, as I already mentioned before, is um, that we want to be able to lock down containers. Uh, that means that we want to make sure that only sanctioned software from a well-known source can be started within the container. So un unauthorized software that some intruder may bring into the container should not execute. So also that should be configurable with, a policy, with the IMA policy. And for that we have what's called IMA appraisal. Here we want to be able to um, uh, have per container key rings. That means each container has its own set of key rings that are independent from those of the host. So that you can run your distribution a different distribution on the host where there's a different distribution inside containers that brings along different keys. So we would implement a bring your own uh, key model. And then for visibility, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to run Keylime inside the containers. Uh, Keylime gives you, uh, allows you to set allow lists, for example, where you can verify or reconcile uh, what has been started inside the container and make sure that uh, whatever is running inside the container uh, is uh, part of that allow list. The allow list basically is uh, defined through hashes of these executables that are going to be started, or it allows you to detect if something, un, um, if an, 
a non-signed executable was attempted to be started inside a container. Um, and of course, um, um, namespacing is a type of virtualization, and we would expect that the IMA namespace inside, the, uh, inside a container behaves just like IMA on the host, so that gives you the least surprises. Also, it accommodates software that has uh, some kind of assumptions on how uh, IMA works on the host, and now can transfer these assumptions in, inside the container. Right. And so, uh, okay, we have a lot of namespaces in Linux nowadays. As you can see, we have C group, IPC, so network, mount, pit, time, user, user namespace, and UTS namespace. And so, one of the starting questions is how the IMA namespacing story should look like. Would you want to have a completely separate namespace? which would mean all of the infrastructure that you see right here. Uh, so if you create a new namespace via clone or unshare, you'd need a new flag. Uh, for example, for user namespaces, it's clone new user, so we would need a flag clone new IMA. Um, and uh, then if you want to move into a separate IMA namespace, you use the setNS system call, which allows you to switch system, uh, namespaces. Um, and uh, then you also need to clarify things like um, if you create a new IMA namespace, uh, is it available to unprivileged users? Is it something that should be guarded uh, behind Capsys admin? So um, it's, it's kind of difficult from an architectural perspective, at least for me initially it was, where and how to fit in the IMA namespace. So the first time I encountered this, um, the proposal was clone new IMA, uh, which would be passed to clone. But then, uh, and I mentioned this to uh, Ste Stefan earlier, um, you get into issues if, if you need to specify a lot of uh, different parameters that need to be uh, set up uh, at namespace creation time, then you need to pass all of that info through, for example, the clone system call. So you end up with a lot of uh, IMAR specific stuff inside of um, core kernel process creation functions, which is something that I found kind of not very tasteful. So um, the solution here is, uh, I think that Stefan has chosen is a bit um, different, which makes it easier um, to implement in my uh, opinion. Another difficulty is that there is no concept of containers in the Linux kernel, um, which uh, makes it also kind of, um, if I'm a namespacing, is mainly useful for the container use case, um, which is, that's what I understood it, um, how it's supposed to be, then it becomes kind of difficult uh, to square this with the fact that we don't ha really have a notion of what a container is inside of, inside of the Linux kernel. This is something a user space concept, as Serge uh, Helen once put it, a user space fiction. Um, and that's mostly true. So um, we need to figure out if we don't make a separate IMA namespace, um, what other namespace can we piggyback on or use for IMA such that it still becomes meaningful and useful to container workloads or to most container workloads um, on, uh, in user space? And that has quite some consequences. If you think that's on the next slide, thank you. So the uh, approach that uh, Stefan has chosen um, was to piggyback on the user namespace. Be it, it makes a lot of sense uh, in various ways. Um, and there is also a social engineering argument, I think, that is uh, quite nice in the sense that um, we want users to use unprivileged uh, containers. And by piggybacking the IMA namespace onto uh, user namespaces, you're also forcing users that want IMA, uh, that want IMA namespacing or um, the integrity guarantees that IMA gives you when used in a container to also use user namespaces, which um, I think is quite nice uh, a side effect. It also has per user namespace isolated key rings. I think this is something that you were quite excited about because you uh, need this. And um, normal users can also spawn an IMA in S. That probably means unprivileged users. That's what you're getting at, right? Yes. So that's, that's something that I'm kind of on the fence about, uh, in the, not necessarily because of IMA, but um, the user namespace is a big and important security uh, isolation mechanism for sure. But uh, it also lets you get at a large attack surface in the kernel quite easily. So by having unprivileged users creating user namespaces, it's always kind of 
uh, it's not always a good idea. If, like, if you have a user after free in a subsystem that you can control from a user namespace, then you already have a privilege escalation, so it may, which makes it kind of um, uh, difficult. But uh, the IMA namespace, putting it on the user namespace, uh, also makes, in my, uh, in my opinion, makes the, um, the ownership and delegation model a lot, uh, a lot clearer. So all of the privileges that you require would be tied to the user namespace. So there is no separate uh, privilege levels that you need for the IMA namespace per se. You can all do this within the user namespace, which is nice. One of the really uh, big requirements that I had and I, uh, that I uh, talked about uh, quite a bit on the mailing list is um, putting IMA namespacing in some shape or form into the user namespace cannot have any impact on the performance of user namespaces or uh, on the creation of user namespaces when IMA is not used. Uh, and I think we've uh, we've now gotten to the point where this is actually the case. And um, yeah, there are some a lot of technical details on how to make this work nicely because so that you don't up, end up with weird ref count issues. So I'm a namespace taking a ref count on user namespace, user namespace taking a ref count on I'm a namespace, and all it's, it's all kinds of weird lifetimes issues. I think we solved all of that. Um, and uh, the overall design is you create a new user namespace. And the IMA namespace is more or less created uh, as soon as you mount um, a security FS uh, instance. So as part of the work that we did, I uh, basically I, I made it possible to namespace security FS, mm -hmm. um, or that's at least the design that I kind of uh, um, gave you. Uh, which I think is the right uh, thing to do uh, in any case because it, the, the way security is, I don't want to attack anyone, but the way security FS is currently implemented is not very nice. Um, and uh, so um, in order to make this work for the IMA NS use case, we had to kind of namespace this. And I think if we do it right, then security FS itself can actually benefit from this by making it a... Uh, um, a file system that works way nicer in namespaces. Anyway, why the security FS approach? Um, in my opinion, um, the fact that there will be a lot of knobs inside of an IMA namespace that you will need to able to twist and turn and so on um, makes it uh, makes it well suited to tie it to the security FS uh, um, uh, file system because other um, LSMs like AppArmor. I don't know about SA Linux, but uh, AppArmor, for example, and I think uh, a few others provide knobs inside of security FS already, so there is precedent uh, for doing that. Um, and um, you don't end up with a lot of unnecessary IOCTLs and so on, or dedicated IMA system calls or whatever, or you have to put it into struct clone. So by making it part of a security FS instance, um, you actually can put in all of the knobs that you want in there. One slight, one thing that I found a bit unpleasant is, but that we have to do this way, is you mount security FS, which creates internally for the kernel a new IMA namespace, but the IMA namespace is not really active. You can then configure it and set it up, and then you can activate the IMA namespace, at which time uh, it actually uh, takes effect. But uh, this is some, I think there's some internal IMA uh, requirements that kind of make this uh, necessary. Yeah. I mean, it's basically what, what you find in that configuration stage is you find those Linux kernel parameters in sysfs again, you write your values that you typically would put on the boot command line, you write them into sysfs, and that becomes the configuration for that uh, namespace. So you can run your host, for example, with SHA-256 for measuring, and you can run your containers with a different hash, SHA-384 if you wanted to, for example. Or what makes a lot of sense is that you have the template name inside the container, a different template, for example, running on the host. So you find template name configuration inside the container, and that's basically, yeah, we, <clears throat> that's where security FS actually comes in very handy to be able to configure your container. And yeah, you activate, you go from, a, from an inactive namespace to configuration stage uh, to the activation of the IMO namespace just by writing again into uh, security FS and then you have an, an active uh, IMO namespace. Um, once you have activated, the configuration is locked. You cannot change your template anymore or you cannot change your, your hash anymore. So that should give you a lot of uh, should give a lot of flexibility also to extend this in the future and uh, provide more configuration ops uh, for containers. 
So here now I, I show you a, a short uh, command line that I, for example, use for, for testing things. So create a directory structure, very simple. There's going to be a very simple container. I use BusyBox a lot because it's uh, don't have to copy a lot of uh, dependencies in terms of libraries into this simple container. And then you run this unshare command line that creates basically a user namespace, mounts a proc file system in it, uh, creates a pit namespace also in this case, because I believe you have to actually do this, and then puts the root FS to where we copy the executable in, and that's our mini container just to, to, uh, to um, test out I'm namespacing. Then we do the mounting here, uh, security FS with, is mounted here in this case on, on the mount directory because SysFS is not easy to come by in this case and we activate it. We don't go here through a uh, configuration stage and then we run an, an audit policy, for example, inside the container. Now the thing with the audit policy here is uh, you have, we decided basically that you have to be host root to be able to set that um, audit policy in the container. The concern here is Primarily that you can cause flooding of uh, audit logs inside a container if you wanted to. I mean, we opened up the uh, creating IMA namespaces for normal users. Now you, and also users gonna con use containers where uh, they hopefully have IMA namespacing enabled. So not everybody should be able to set auditing rules and cause lots of audit messages on the host so that it drives audit uh, subsystem into dropping messages and audit messages uh, get lost. So that is a restriction on, on the auditing rules. However, normal users can, uh, so unprivileged users can set measure and appraise rules inside of containers. Uh, so that uh, there, there is no there is no restriction restriction here on that. So there are lots of challenges when it comes to namespacing IMA, and I just want to throw a couple of you at you, and we go more in more detail later on. So um, basically, grouped them into different uh, um, groups here on the conceptual level, on the implementation level, and on the performance level. So on the conceptual level, we basically don't want root to abuse user namespace uh, spawning and an IMA namespace configuration and so on uh, to hide its activity on the host. Typically what you can do is uh, you can write a policy so that uh, whatever root does in the TCB uh, is going to get logged uh, in the IMA log. Things get measured and logged in the IMA log. So we don't want to open up here a security hole that uh, uh, root just spawns user namespaces, configures uh, possibly IMA namespaces and tries to hide its uh, um, activity in uh, that he does basically on the host when he shares all the other user namespaces. If you see that in the subsequent slide. Then I already talked about this uh, audit messages that are emitted from IMA namespaces. They should be distinguishable from those emitted on the host. There's a patch series out there and has been out there for, for, for a while actually that uh, allows uh, uh, the configuration of uh, containers with an ID that then uh, allows you to distinguish these audit messages that are admitted from the audit subsystem uh, from those on the host by setting a container ID. Um, and then I already again also talked about this. We want to avoid the flooding uh, of the audit subsystem with messages. So we don't allow root to set these uh, audit messages for uh, inside the IMA policy, we uh, well, only allow root to set these audit messages, prevent uh, unprivileged users from doing this, so they don't just create uh, containers and then flood the audit system. We also want to allow this allowed indirect control uh, to um, unprivileged users to cut audit messages, and what this means is basically that you can that users would be able to set uh, um, policies which then audit which then are audited line by line. So again, this could be abused by just creating lots of uh, containers, just quickly setting a couple of policies, flooding the subsystem, tearing down the container, and doing the whole thing over. Um, so, and then what is important is we can distinguish, uh, the, we want to be able to distinguish where the audit messages are coming from, from which container. We also need to be able to distinguish where the log entries are coming from, from which container. We'll see why the, while that is uh, important. So on the implementation level, we have a particular issue here with having to track state of uh, files for each individual namespace so that we can track which particular files have already been measured by containers and appraised and then uh, particular shared files between containers are, are an issue. 
uh, where, we, uh, where it can happen that one container modifies a file that then has to be, again, remeasured in all the other containers that sharing that file. So we have to organize our data structures accordingly, which then leads to some, uh, some particular locking issues, when, when we, as we will see uh, later on in the presentation. So each user namespace needs a distinguishable UUID so that we can distinguish uh, where the um, measurements are coming from. Of course, testing, as always, is a big issue. We don't want to break anything. Um, the size of the undertaking here is that uh, there are more, I have more than 100 patches now that make up IMA namespacing, all the different uh, uh, parts of IMA, IMA auditing, IMA, na IMA measurement, and IMA appraisal. So testing of this is uh, important that nothing breaks and nothing breaks on the host. Um, and something that I have not looked at at all, but that may be a concern also in the, uh, sometime in the future, is uh, CRIO, this is container and uh, no, checksum checkpoint and restore in user space. And what that actually means to IMA, the implementation, but also on the conceptual level, for example, if you were to checkpoint a container, reboot the system and restore the container, what that means about the logs that you have, for example, on the host, because they're now all erased. Uh, or they don't look, look uh, as they did before you did the checkpoint and, and restore. Right? So on the performance level, uh, we have something that we need to introduce, uh, primarily to, to the uh, wanting to not allow user, the root users to hide its activity, what we call hierarchical evaluation of the activity in the IMA namespace. Uh, again, I have some slides on that, so for now it's just throw this at you here. Um, and then there are uh, some performance issues to the locking that is needed for the tracking of the state of the, of the sh shared files. Um, so one of the challenges, again going back to the first item in the previous slide, you want, don't want to allow root to hide its activity in, um, in parent namespaces. So for example, share, unsharing a user namespace that creates a new user namespace, and then the root user runs some program in that user namespace. That should be subject to evaluation against the policy on the host. He should not be able to hide its activity because with this unshare uh, command line here, you basically have just unshared, a, created a new user namespace, but you're still sharing the same PIT amount and IPC and so on namespaces of the host. So that's pretty much like running an executable on the host but here you run it in, in a different user namespace. Or you have that example here of uh, creating nested user namespaces where uh, you can go to 16 or 32 levels deep and try to run your programs there, and all of that should still be visible in the parent namespaces. So this hierarchical requirement actually makes it kind of nice because there are two namespaces, pit namespace and user namespace, which are properly hierarchical. So they're already walked anyway and implemented in a way that you always know what, what the relationship between the parent and uh, the child namespace is. Yeah. So, IMA namespaces, therefore, are not completely isolated. But for example, if you look at, uh, uh, for example, the network namespace, it's not completely isolated either. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to send any network packets out. So you have to be able to connect them between the uh, container network to the, to the host network. So there are ways to do this. Similarly, IMA namespaces are not completely isolated either. Uh, so what we basically want to do is here, as you see in the screen, uh, nested child IMA namespaces. That if there is a policy here that allow that where you're supposed to be able to where the, the container is supposed to um, take measurements of the executable that is start in there, it's going to start the executable and take a um, measurement of the executable and log it in uh, in the log inside that IMA namespace. But then, uh, due to our requirement that root, and actually also regular users are not supposed to hide their activity in, um, in child namespaces. We step back to the parent namespace, evaluate the, the file activity that you have done in the child namespace against the policy of, the, um, of that uh, child namespace, and then, uh, for example, log again here. And we do this all the way back to the root IMA namespace. So that all the activity that happens in child IMA namespaces is again visible in the root IMA namespace. Uh, so, but that also means that, uh, for example, uh, when, you, when root is, let's say, running an IMA 
an executable that is supposed to be appraised uh, inside a child namespace, it may not execute because it's, uh, the child IMA namespace doesn't have a key that allow, would allow it to, uh, to execute. So that, on the other hand, would mean that root cannot just spawn an IMA namespace uh, because he doesn't have the key to execute this uh, executable, escape into that uh, IMA namespace or the user namespace, try to execute that file there, and there's no, um, there's no policy, for example, set. So he's going to be subject to ev evaluation uh, against the um, policy on the host. So we call this hierarchical evaluation of the IMA policy, and that has some effect also on, on the performance of the system and, and so on. As you can imagine, you have to do more, more work, obviously. Uh, however, you can write your IMA policy also in such a way that uh, all IMA namespace activity is being ignored. And that's, uh, you can do this through UID selector and how, um, how you map, for example, the user IDs uh, in these child IMA namespaces. So every, uh, every spawned IMA namespace may then cause logging on the host. And what we do here is we basically create a new UID for each user namespace. User namespace already exists today. They don't have a configuration stage. So what, uh, what we resorted to is basically slap a UUID on this uh, user namespace uh, so that it becomes dis uh, distinguishable from the activity of all the other user namespaces that are being created. Uh, what that, however, means is that you have uh, possibly lots of different measurements on the host, each with a different uh, UUID. So, for example, if you were to execute the above line uh, multiple times in, uh, yeah, and run it in, obviously, in, in, in child namespaces, you may get different, um, get different log entries, depending on whether we decide to uh, re-log the sum program here in this case uh, in, the, in the parent namespaces. Also then, for that, we introduce a new um, I'm, I'm a template that allows you to make these UUIDs visible in a column. So you have the log and you see an additional column there where you, the UUID of the, of the um, user namespace where the executable was run, was, uh, how that, um, so that you see where, where it was run. So then coming back to the, the organization of the data structures uh, where we need to make sure that uh, we can track for uh, the files between the file, the state of files that are shared between IMA namespaces. So there is currently what's called the IMA integrity cache, the INT cache, where IMA tracks each individual inode, whether it has uh, already measured the file, appraised the file, uh, and resets the flags if the file, for example, was changed or needs to be uh, reappraised. So what we will introduce is a, what we introduce here is a per IMA namespace integrity iint cache. Um, that is mostly to avoid um, that uh, individual namespaces start locking each other out too much. Um, and the, what we are striving to do there is, uh, is to optimally organize our data structures so we want to use lists that have uh, um, access uh, complexity in the order of O of N, and again, the trees O of log of N, and at the same time, avoid searches across namespaces, so that, for example, if you have a shared file, you don't have to search across all the namespaces and see where has this, to with which namespace has this uh, file been, um, been shared, so that it can, for example, um, it may have to be remeasured or when you reset flags that you find them pretty quickly. So what we have here is uh, what's out there right now is what, what uh, is a global uh, IMA integrity cache. It's a basically a red black tree where uh, state, represent, state information for each inode that was accessed per the policy of IMA is, uh, is maintained there. So files that are subject to the IMA policy that are um, maintained in this RB tree. And then what we now do is we introduce an RB tree per IMA namespace. The goal here is to uh, spread out the locking between these individual namespaces so that they can um, have better performance, right? can access their file fa files faster because they don't lock each other out when the, when the RB tree needs to be modified. Uh, so we track individual inodes that are uh, uh, executed in, in these um, namespaces, 
in, uh, in an RB tree, in individual RB trees. And then what we do is when these files are shared between uh, namespaces, we also put them on a linked list. So you, if you, for example, want to reset flags on inode number two, um, you walk across this list here and you reset the flags, for example, to cause a re-measurement of a file when the file was uh, um, modified in one of those namespaces. So, and, and in this case, um, so we have done the problem that the, our files are now uh, on, on two lists. One time it's on the list uh, to, um, for each uh, inode, and then on the other hand, it's located on, uh, on an RB tree. So that leads to what I would de describe as a mesh problem. Um, and the situation that you're going to run into is that at some point when you tear down an IMA namespace, uh, you have to basically delete the RB tree. But what can happen at the same time as you tear down the RB tree is that you uh, delete files in the file system, right? So that actually happens. And uh, you're running in that problem that uh, this, uh, the state information that you have stored and that is linked onto this linked list and is also located on the RB tree now has to be uh, deleted from both at the same time. Now the solution is here, um, and the, that's a lock, becomes a locking problem, and the solution is uh, basically what I call group locking, um, where we only allow concurrent namespace deletion or concurrent file deletions. So either you delete, uh, you're accessing this uh, all linked lists, that is you're coming from the, from the left side or you're coming only from, from the top side, so that uh, the shared accesses to these nodes here that are uh, shown as black dots can be avoided and that you don't run into um, uh, this linking problem, that, uh, this access problem on, on, on items that are um, located on, two, um, on, on the RB tree and on, on a linked list. So now to the, in, to the area of performance. I've done, done some performance measurements. Um, for that, I have compiled the Linux kernel and I'm using this policy here that's shown. Uh, the file check rule that's, uh, um, that's in this um, policy causes a lot of measurements to be taken when you compile the Linux kernel. Um, basically, every file that's opened, every .c or .h file that's opened is going to be measured. So that puts a lot of load on, on IMA to see that um, basically it's a good use case for, uh, for measuring the performance uh, of IMA. The other two rules um, basically uh, measure um, libraries and executables that are being started during the compilation process. Uh, all test cases that we have done are uh, compiling the same Linux kernel with the same .config, of course, so that every, every time the same kernel is being compiled. And what I did is I derived from a Fedora 36 kernel um, the, the configuration uh, that I'm using for the IMA namespacing, the IMA namespace patch kernel. Um, it makes a big difference which one you're using here as a baseline to derive the configuration from because there are differences between 5.17 kernels versus 5.18 if you use them, if you compare the performance. Stock 5.17 versus stock 5.18. Uh, have, have performance differences. So I'm using one that is as close as possible to the one that I am currently working on for, uh, for development purposes. Um, so all patches of all stages are applied in these tests. It's um, more than 100 uh, patches. Um, the tests inside the IMA namespace use the same policy as on the host, but I'm, I'm wearing this. Sometimes I'm running uh, the host with a policy, sometimes only inside the IMA namespace, and sometimes in, in both. So that causes as much load as possible. I do a make clean before a reboot, so that it cleans all the files, nothing, um, nothing gets... That every, every time you reboot the system, it starts with a clean kernel already, and then we do the build. Uh, I do the test, three test runs each, and uh, take the average, basically. So this is how this, this looks like. Uh, the, the baseline here was a 5.18.5 kernel from Fedora. Um, I applied the policy on the host, built the Linux kernel on the host, took 358 seconds. Then I um, 
used the 5.19 kernel that I patched with IMA namespacing support, again built on the host, used the same policy on the host, so it's pretty much just a different kernel. But due to the locking that we are doing here, this uh, um, group locking that I had to introduce, there is a little bit of a performance degradation. So you have, uh, it took 362 seconds, that's 1% uh, performance loss basically, when I started compiling this from inside the host, from, from the host. So the next, the green one here, is uh, basically um, I'm building now inside the IMA namespace. On the there's only a policy on the host. The IMA namespace doesn't have a policy, it doesn't do any measurements, so this is pretty quick. The, the measurements, uh, the, the results are pretty much the same here. Again, 362 seconds, because we can skip over the, the measurements taken inside the, inside, the, uh, inside the IMA namespace and go immediately to the host. So there's no, um, there's no performance degradation expected. Then I uh, did a policy, or uh, put a policy inside the IMA namespace only. For some reason, I got a little bit different uh, uh, performance numbers here. It's 366 seconds. Uh, that actually shouldn't be the case because we, on the host, there's no policy. It should skip over that pretty quickly. Uh, when, when it does the hierarchical evaluation. And then um, what's currently work in progress is when I have uh, a policy on the host and in the IMA namespace. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a lot of uh, performance loss at the moment because uh, every file is being uh, measured twice. That's measured inside the IMA namespace and then measured again on the host instead of recycling, for example, or trying to find when you go onto the host, trying to find an, a measurement that was already taken uh, in an IMA namespace when you do the hierarchical evaluation. So now to a test suite, I, I build a test suite um, based on common available tools, beyond, uh, tools, the unshared tool that I have showed to you earlier. Um, I'm using NSenter, BusyBox, because it's uh, easy when it's statically linked, just need to use one executable, don't need any de dependencies. Uh, and key control and EVM control are commonly used tools when you do IMA appraisal and when you deal with uh, um, key rings and so on. Uh, it provides coverage for nearly as every aspect of the IMA uh, enablement in the IMA namespaces. I'm using different policies in these containers uh, auditing policies, measurement policies, appraisal policies, or combination of all of them. It touches most of the aspects of the um, IMA policy language that is relevant to containers. So all of the language pretty much is, is covered with that. I'm connecting a virtual TPM to IMA namespaces uh, to test that the IMA, uh, that the virtual TPM takes, um, gets all the measurements or the, gets all the PCR extensions and the number of PCR extension is, is correct. And, uh, well, I can run many hundred of these containers concurrently. The intention here is, of course, to make sure that locking holds up. And we're testing also with uh, nested user and IMA namespaces to make sure that the hierarchical evaluation works correctly, that uh, executables that are uh, not signed on the host don't execute because you're run trying to run them on inside the container. Um, yeah, so you can run multiple instances of this test suite concurrently, again, to make sure that the locking holds up, and uh, in that case, you may get uh, some errors, um, some timeouts that you can trigger. Obviously, you're reducing the number of cycles that the test suite has to, to do its work, so you might run into timeouts, or what can also happen is uh, log rotation uh, that occurs um, because we're grabbing through the number of results that have been put into the audit log, uh, log rotation can come into the way and, um, uh, and the number gets screwed. So, in terms of the upstreaming that we want to do, we put this into basically four different stages. The first stage is out there. Uh, that's where we virtualize the security uh, file system uh, that allows us to run multiple instances or create multiple instances of uh, security FS. Um, then we uh, have support for spawning an IMA namespace uh, that is using mounting of the security FS and activating it. The, there's an IMA policy support 
in this uh, first series that only allows you to enable auditing message because we only en enable auditing because it's the least amount of work um, and so the least amount of patches uh, that need to be upstream. And then there's Linux cap capability support for being able to uh, the user to, for example, set uh, poli read policies in the IMA namespace um, that uh, yeah, otherwise regular users wouldn't be able to do. So in, the, in that uh, part of the uh, staging, we basically kind of, uh, looked for all the static variables and global variables and put them into an IMA namespace. Uh, and yeah, but that's, um, and in the second stage, we want to enable IMA measurements, adds a couple more um, patches to it. There's going to be an IMA names, uh, per IMA namespace log. Um, that behaves just like the, the log of, on the, of the host. And in this stage, we will add the configuration stage uh, to IMA namespacing that is done via the security FS. It is not necessary to do this um, at the earlier stage. So the, the, the goal being, I hope that after we have finished stage one, most of the stuff uh, is basically uh, things that you need to do in IMA, not in generic infrastructure. Yes, I mean there are a lot of things are being put in in place in in the first in the first stage, and there are some things with the locking that are maybe harder to digest. But once we have that, I think that uh, the rest should become a lot more easy. Um, and then in the third stage, we want to enable IMA appraisal uh, with uh, isolated key rings for each IMA namespace. Again, need to introduce Linux capability support here so that regular users can also write security.ima. Uh, extended attributes which they are not able to do today, for example. It's a, that's a privileged operation, so I'm being told two minutes. Um, and then also in this uh, case we have to touch EVM. Uh, the uh, extended, verification mod extended verification module that is pulled in uh, due to IMA appraisal. In the fourth stage we will then add uh, the virtual TPM support. Um, so the prototype, I build a prototype uh, with run C. Uh, that is a pretty uh, commonly used Golang library. Uh, uses uh, uh, several um, container projects, and you find all the things pretty much automated uh, that have been done before. Here, you have to write a configuration file where you put the configuration uh, information into this configuration file to uh, set the hash of the um, that is, uh, the namespace is stored on it with the template that the namespace has to run with, you put this in the configuration file and uh, run C sets it up for you. It also allows you to attach a virtual TPM. Actually, you can attach multiple virtual TPMs and you can say, for example, if it's, uh, the virtual TPM support is uh, to be run a software TPM setup, which simulates the manufacturing of a TPM. It also simulates uh, what's typically done on the host via Draycut scripts, and that is uh, it tries to find in the directory structure the keys um, that it needs to put into uh, the key rings so that IMA appraisal has the keys uh, needed for evaluation, and also it loads the IMA policy in, in the container. So that, and that not, nothing of uh, what you have put in there in terms of keys or so or signatures um, gets modified while after you build your container, it's a good idea to sign your containers so that uh, this container is basically protected and the keys inside that container are protected and the signatures inside the container are protected. So now to the summary, uh, you should think of namespaces as instances of objects. Um, basically you want to create new objects, put, uh, put your uh, variables in a, in, a, in a data structure so you can create those new data structures and uh, basically what you have to do is you have to pass around, um, uh, in our case, the IMA namespace data structure between the, between the function. Then I already talked about this. Uh, IMA has some unique issues uh, that we have to cover. There's the hierarchical evaluation of the policy. There is this particular uh, need for tracking the state of files between, that are shared between um, IMA namespaces. And I would suggest if your namespace is a subsystem, make it uh, work like the, the system works on the host so that uh, it causes the least, the least of the surprises. And um, at least in our case, test-driven uh, development has helped a lot. Uh, detect errors of, uh, and yeah, no. it, testing is always a good idea. So 
some acknowledgements here at the end. So I want to uh, thank James Bartomley and Christian Browner for putting the train on the right track and for the multi-instance capable security file systems and for the patch reviews. Uh, Dennis Samakin for the work on the IMA namespace capability uh, support and Mimi and Serge Hallin for feedback and the patches. So I think we're actually over time. Excellent. Thank you very much. We have a um, virtual question from an attendee, Mark Novak. How are VTPMs endorsed and how is their internal state protected? Yeah, the, um, the internal state of the virtual TPM is primarily protected through encryption if you wanted to, but then you have to have trust into the, the root user on the host, right? So that um, the, the state is being written into files, so you have to trust it. And the endorsement, yeah, you have to, I guess what he's alluding to, um, how, where the certificates are coming from, who's creating the certificates, in this case, you have to set up your own certificate infrastructure uh, so that these uh, certificates that you create for the TPM, they have to be files, basically, that are um, put on the, on the file system. I hope that answers, I ha hope that answers <laughs> the question. Any more questions? Otherwise, I guess we all want to go to lunch. <laughs> and then if you want to collaborate with me, please, um, I'm open to collaboration. It's a lot of work to get that stuff upstream, I think. Thank you. Thank you.